I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to talk about the work of the Mint. And I understand that if I were doing this in New York, and I had an audience filled with people who knew and loved me, I would know why you might be interested. But I mean, I would know why they would be interested, but I'm not sure I know why you would be interested. So I want to start off um, by making sure you know a little bit more about the Mint. Um, and, and I want to say that, I, that what I'd like to talk about is, I don't think the choices I've made are necessarily inherently interesting to you or anyone else, but the process I think might be interesting and I want to try to uh, talk about the process of what I do um, in a more general way because I hope that might be valuable. Um, so uh, as it happens, just a week ago, uh, a local television station in New York uh, aired this um, three and a half minute video that covers a lot of ground in terms of introduction to the work of the Mint. And um, if you hit play, I'll step out of the way and, and you'll know. York's Mint Theater Company thinks so, and our Donna Hanover agrees. The Mint Theater Company in New York produces lost or neglected plays. Its artistic director since 1995 is Jonathan Bank. The motto of the Mint Theater Company is lost plays found here. There was the Lillian Hellman play they put up in 2018. Lillian Hellman, of course, very famous for a number of plays, but Days to Come is, is a play from early in her career that flopped and I think undeservedly so. Sometimes they do plays by writers who are actually famous as novelists, like Ernest Hemingway. We did the premiere of Ernest Hemingway's The Fifth Column in 2008. He wrote one play. Hemingway's version of The Fifth Column had never been done. That's correct, it had never been done. And we made a recording of that and shared it with scholars across the world. And delightfully uh, to his son, Patrick Hemingway, who came to see it and loved it. The Mint has also done plays by A.A. A. Milne. Before Winnie the Pooh, he was a really famous, successful playwright. He had four plays running simultaneously on Broadway in 1921-22. And Winnie the Pooh ruined his playwriting career. <laughs> <laughs> and you brought it back? It's a great play, Mr. Pym Passes By is the first one we did. The Mint's website presents 12 black playwrights whose works have been neglected, and readings are planned for some of those plays later this year. Often the Mint Theater shows are staged in a 99-seat theater here in the West 42nd Street Theater Row Building. But sometimes they go for a larger house as for their first show back after the pandemic. That's The Daughter-in-Law by D.H. Lawrence, which opened recently at City Center Stage 2. He never saw it published, he never saw it produced, it was a typescript in a drawer. Shows that have physical conflict get added rehearsal for safety. And for all plays, the Mint does something special. For years, they've had their shows professionally shot and edited. So during the pandemic, they had videos of wonderful productions to stream online when folks couldn't gather in theaters. People were invited to pay, but if money was tight, you invited them to watch for free. It was a real pleasure to give the work away and to pay the artist. And a lot of that was made possible through the federal programs. The Paycheck Protection Program certainly helped us to pay the salaries. Well-known actors are excited to be part of the Mint's work. Like in 2017, when Max von Essen, known as a great singer and a Tony nominee for the Broadway musical An American in Paris, acted in Yours Unfaithfully by Miles Mallison, written back in 1935. Max von Essen actually made his, his you know, legit uh, debut. It was his first straight play. But I read in interviews that he was a little scared, but he did a fantastic job. Irish playwright Teresa Devey, who wrote in the 1930s, has been highlighted by The Mint. The Mint has published two anthologies of Devey's work and four anthologies of other playwrights they've produced because once they bring a play back, they want to keep it from getting lost again. There is a sense in the world that cream always rises to the top. It doesn't, it takes a lot of pushing. And some plays and playwrights don't get that pushing. And that's where we come in. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City.
Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. So, <clears throat> um, I hope that gives you a little taste and uh, helps to make this all a little bit more relevant and interesting to you. Um, so I plan to discuss the, my work of finding and producing lost and neglected plays over the last 25 years in three different ways. Searching, chapter one, seeing, chapter two, and how it all began, chapter three. Um, Exploding the Canon is the title I gave this talk, but I don't pretend that's an accurate description of the programming or the mission of the Mint. Ignoring the dramatic canon is more to the point. Mint Theater Company produces forgotten plays. Not new plays, not classic plays, but old plays that audiences, academics, and producers have all forgotten about or never knew. Is there an accepted canon of the indisputably finest, most excellent plays, the great works of dramatic literature? I don't think so. Even if someone wanted to argue that point, it would be a list of, uh, it, would be, it would be a canon based on the written word, minus actors and an audience. So it would be a literary assessment and only students, scholars, and actors read plays anyway. I won't argue the value of making a literary assessment alone, but I will say that has very little to do with producing plays. Plays in production are the result of collaborative efforts and contributions from directors, designers, and actors. And these things are hard to unwind from each other, maybe impossible to unwind from each other. Even when I know how it all gets together, I can't know whether that bad idea belonged to the actor or the director or <laughs> the actor's girlfriend. Um, but reading plays is hard, too. And it's not a skill very many people need to acquire. Not scholars, not even actors, certainly not critics or audiences. So there are hundreds of lists covering plays in production, the longest running shows on Broadway, the most produced plays in American regional theaters, Tony winners, top 10 of the year, that sort of thing. None of them pretend to evaluate merit in any lasting sense. This season, the last five seasons maybe. Another form of list that exists is the table of contents of various collections anthologies that often serve as textbooks in basic survey courses, 20 great European plays, great plays of the 20th century, and so forth. I think it's fair to say that many of these collections are put together by scholars who are making a literary assessment. They're striving to represent categories of plays, categories of authors, nationalities, and so forth. Plus, of course, historical trends. Plays that start new trends and change the course of what follows, those plays get in the book. The second play on that trend that was much better than the one that ch charted the course, that doesn't make it into the book. The goals of these textbooks, these anthologies, is usually fairly narrow and the number of plays included are limited. Anthologies have played a really important role in the story of the Mint Theater Company. I can trace my interest in unknown work back to several collections of plays, collections published decades ago, some collections that are textbooks and some that are intended to serve a different audience, not students or scholars, but readers. The Best Plays series I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's been published annually for 100 years. It's an example of a collection intended to serve a general interest. Burns Mantle was the first editor of the series. He was the drama critic for the New York Evening Mail and the Daily News. And he edited the best plays books for about 25 years, one a year for the season, beginning in 1920. And he picked the 10 best plays each season 
The plays were then included in the book in an abridged version. And I can't imagine anybody ever reading these abridged plays where Burns would kind of make, would get you from one scene to the next with a couple sentences, skipping the dialogue. I, I don't understand. But anyway, the series was then handed off to another critic, then another, and as I said, I think it's still being published annually. Among the 10 best plays of this year or that, anyone with some interest and knowledge of theater history would, if you looked at the table of contents, probably recognize one or two titles. And if not the titles, one or two authors. And that leaves another eight or nine titles that you might not recognize at all. And the first time I looked at one of his lists, I just assumed the plays I had never heard of weren't as good as the ones I knew. Because if it was of any lasting value, why, why had I never heard it? I know this one, why don't I know these? Must be a reason, there must be a reason, I thought. But then it occurred to me that when Mantle picked those 10 plays, they were all equals. His list was not a ranking from one to 10, you know, with the one being the one I'd heard of and nine through 10 being the one I hadn't heard of. That wasn't it, it was just 10, the 10 best. <coughs> now, I'm not saying he didn't have favorites and I'm not saying there was not some play that was number 10 that made it in just ahead of number 11 and that he debated which one to include because he wrote about all that in his introductions. So sure, some plays got left out, some plays were included in maybe a sort of random way, but still it was the 10 best plays, all equals. And that made me wonder if maybe I shouldn't try reading some of those plays that I never heard of. It sounds fairly obvious, I, I understand. But I think it's really important to question this assumption that the world is fair, that, like I said up there, that, that the cream will always rise to the top. But we have a hard time doing this in our lives. It's very inefficient, it requires judgment, which can be exhausting. Isn't this why Brands are so important to signal quality and value to a world of consumers that is afraid or disinclined to decide for themselves. That's why so much investment is made in the power of the brand, because if we can get you to trust us, we can sell you anything. So when I realized that every collection of representative plays or great plays might also contain a mix of titles, that I knew and others that I didn't. I, and I started buying these out of print anthologies. And I have shelves and shelves of them. I own hundreds of these anthologies. And the out of print, the older the better, because when, when it's the great plays of the 20th century published in 1922, that same great plays of the 20th century published in 1945 with a new editor, but from the same publisher, there's big turnover and what gets dropped out. So you want the volume where nothing's been dropped out yet. Um, I remember buying two books almost 30 years ago from a used bookstore in New York City, each for a buck. And one was the Theater Guild Anthology a collection of 14 plays from the early history of the Theater Guild, which was an important producing organization that did a lot to raise the level of theater production in America, starting in the 1920s. And that's where I found Mr. Pim Passes By and my AA Mill. Looked at the table of contents. I recognized Milne's name as someone quite famous. And I thought, if the play was any good, others might be curious about it. And I had no idea that the creator of Winnie the Pooh had written the play, but 
as I said, uh, I soon discovered he wrote dozens of them and was quite successful. Reading the play, I was pretty sure that it was quite funny. But I remember having some doubt because it was really subtle and wry. And I, I knew it was touching, but funny is harder to gauge when you're sitting alone in a room with a book. I decided I would look for reviews from the play, play's first production and see what others thought about it. And I found exactly what I was looking for. What I've learned over the years is that if you read a good number of reviews, and I mean a dozen or more, you come away with a pretty clear sense of the play's strengths and weaknesses. If you read just one, you get one person's opinion. It doesn't matter what paper they write for, it's still just one person's opinion. But if you read a dozen, the trends are clear. Here's some of what I found. The most brilliant light comedy since Oscar Wilde. Utterly delightful, a comedy of clever satire, every line freighted with a wealth of meaning for the nimble-witted, and of a humor so subtle that it was a pure joy to be in on it. Under somewhat fantastic and sparkling dialogue runs the thread of a perfectly sane and serious study of marriage. The fact that it is almost continuously witty does not prevent it from being at the same time thoughtful and searching. So even though nobody had ever heard of the play, I produced it, and audiences loved it, and we got lots of lovely reviews, just like Milne got in 1919, and 1920, and 1921. And I, I ended up doing the play three different times at the Mint, and once elsewhere, always to a great reception. And I learned a few lessons from this experience. One is to find the people you can trust. So in this case, it was the Theater Guild. I knew that they had good taste. They had done important work, work that I knew, that I recognized, that I cared about. So when I picked up their anthology, I knew what I, I knew I was, I knew the brand of the Theater Guild. And, I, and when I say that, we're really talking about a couple people. I, you know, I won't bother you with their names, but the play picking committee, I knew who they were. And I knew they had good taste, and Mr. Pym verified that. I actually ended up doing a second play from that volume in 2007, a play called John Ferguson by St. John Irvine. And I go back to their full production history all the time. They messed up the fifth column, but but did a lot of great work otherwise. Um, now, another lesson here is that I, I, it was easy for me to understand why nobody ever produced Mr. Pin Passes By anymore, why it fell off of the, the uh, canon of plays available for production. The problem at the center of the play is the discovery that Olivia Marden may have accidentally committed bigamy when she married George. She thought her husband died after he had abandoned her, but then Mr. Pym passes by and says otherwise, which George finds very concerning. The shifting attitudes and mores may have made the reaction to bigamy hard to relate to 20 years later. And so the play is dated. We don't care, we're not worried about bigamy. What's the big deal? And the play gets labeled as dated and it's no longer relevant because bigamy is no longer a topic, although it's still illegal. But when I read the play 75 years later, I could look past the specifics of the disagreement over the importance of accidental bigamy. And I could see that it was a play about a relationship, about a marriage. And the universal truths that were explored in the play came through clearly, just as those reviews from 1920 understood that it was a play about a marriage, about a relationship. So now the audience in 
1997 and 2005, accepted that hu the husband, George, cared too much about what his neighbors thought and too little about his own sense of right and wrong. One critic described my production of the play as far more, described the play in my production as far more relevant than many contemporary relationship plays and as brisk and refreshing as a summer breeze. No honey from Pooh's creator here, but a finer elixir, sophisticated and subtle. And at the center, a theatrical rarity, two adults in a resilient and healthy marriage. No problem with the big me. The point that I want to make here is that a play can go from relevant and timely to dated and back to relevant if it's about essential human truths. It can take decades for that to happen when the importance of the details fade and the humanity of the story comes to the forefront as I'm describing with Mr. Pym. But we rarely have a chance to find that out because the play goes out of print, it's not included in the next anthology, nobody ever talks about it again, and that's the end. It's dated, it's over. You can't really shake the stink of that off once it seeps in. So learning that lesson encouraged me not to judge a play by the description of its plot, but rather to read it and make my own decision about its value in the present moment. And not to make that decision in the first act either, when it seems like the problem might be dated, but to take it to the end and find out. So I mentioned buying two anthologies at that time. The other was the Pulitzer Prize plays 1918 to 1934, a volume you're familiar with, I'm sure. <clears throat> I recognized some of the titles in that table of contents and others were unfamiliar. Well, I ended up producing two plays from that volume in the early days of the Mint, Allison's House by Susan Glaspell, which we produced in 1999, and Miss Lulu Bet by Zona Gale, which we produced the following year. In each case, the Mint production was the first New York revival. Notice that both of these plays were written by women. I'm not saying that's the reason neither had ever been revived, but that fact did get my attention. And I've been especially eager to read and produce plays by women ever since. The point is these were Pulitzer Prize winning plays, done once, never revived. And the other point is, is to say that I'm not, as Dan mentioned, I'm not really in the business of reassessing plays that were never properly appreciated. I'm reading plays that were highly regarded and subsequently forgotten. And there's nothing remarkable in that. I mean, the searching I'm doing is hardly noteworthy because in the main, I'm reading published work. I don't have any data on what percentage of plays get both produced and published. The number has to be tiny. Some fraction of a single percent, I would think. For an author, getting produced at all is quite an accomplishment. And if that play is never produced again, it's an unremarkable occurrence. The number of plays that are produced and revived even once is very small and vastly outnumbered by the plays that are forgotten. And even with plays that are produced and revived, many are never published. But still, there's an assumption that if I've never heard of it, it must not be any good. Combating that perception is, in many ways, my hidden agenda. My dream is that people who see a handful of good plays at the Mint will think twice before rejecting something, anything, simply because it's unfamiliar. My hope is that maybe the positive experiences theater goers accrue at the Mint will create some hesitancy in their tendency to assume that only the best is remembered and only the undeserving will be forgotten. I think we all want to believe that quality will always be recognized and rewarded and that whatever is deserving of attention will get that attention. Obviously, this isn't true. Maybe everyone knows it isn't true, but I don't think so. 
At the Mint, I cast actors with this in mind too, generally using very fine actors who are well suited to their parts, but whose names are unfamiliar. There have been exceptions over the years, and those exceptions are interesting to people who want to make three minute clips, and then suddenly Max von Essen, you know, gets 30 seconds out of three minutes because he's a Tony nominated Broadway singer and a terrific actor who had to audition twice. Um, so, yes, there have been exceptions, and I understand and appreciate the appeal of celebrity, but I want to cast according to the same principles I use when picking the plays, which is to understand that those actors I have never heard of may be just as good or better as those who are famous and celebrated. And for over 25 years, I've attended every one of our open call auditions and happily given my attention to actors with no agents, without fancy credits, because I know the role that luck can play in making a career, a career for an actor, a career for a play, a career for an artist of any sort, a person of any sort. Luck, or something like it, also plays a role when it comes to what plays survive and what plays disappear. I think I want to emphasize that nearly all plays disappear. That doesn't mean the text no longer can be found. Nowadays, when a book is out of print, it's not a very meaningful event because every used bookstore in the world posts their inventory up online. And I found and purchased some very old and very rare books for very little, except for the shipping from Australia. <laughs> I have another anthology story that I think is the story of luck. The story of my luck, at any rate. In 2005, I produced and directed a production of a play called The Lonely Way by Arthur Schnitzler, an Austrian writer who was very well known in Europe in the first several decades of the last century. This was the second Schnitzler play for me in the Mint. There was only ever one American production of this play, a production played by bad luck, as it happens. Here comes the theater guild again. <clears throat> they commissioned a translation of this play from a writer named Julian Lee. The play was scheduled for an unusually extensive out-of-town tryout, a week in Baltimore, another in Washington, followed by Cincinnati and Chicago before coming to New York. During the tryout period, one of the main actors broke his leg skating, and he was replaced, as it happens. By the time the play was in DC, the Theater Guild decided to pull the plug. They, they didn't really love the replacement actor. They said they would bring it to New York next season when Tom Powers leg healed. They never brought it to New York. It was never heard from again. So this is the story of a failure. A couple of weeks on the road, closed down, done. The bad luck of that story is countered by my good fortune that Lee's translation somehow wound up in an anthology, representative modern drama. Enter, uh, edited by Charles Huntington Whitman, published in 1936. I don't know how Whitman even knew about the play, much less track down a copy of the Lee translation, which was never published anywhere else. He would have had to go to the theater guild and say, can I see the typescript? And Whitman trusted his taste and was brave enough to include the play in his anthology. There was another English version of the play published in 1915, but it's terrible. Uh, you, without the version that Whitman published, I, I never would have known about the play or chosen it for, for production. I couldn't read the other version. And again, forgive me for quoting my own reviews, but here's what the New York Times said about the play and the production. The Mint Theater is now doing its utmost to restore Schnitzler to where he rightfully belongs alongside such dramatists of middle class life as Chekhov and Ibsen. Following its successful 2003 production of 
schnitzler's far and wide the mint is presenting new york's first production of the lonely way which has been seen only once in the united states since its 1904 premiere in berlin this spare lucid production is a revelation of an intensely moral work that finds breath-stopping drama where most of us find it in our own lives in conversation those we're vulnerable with a parent a lover a child most of the plays that the mint produces are written in english as it happens because i have to be able to read a play to choose it and unlike real scholars i have no other languages I don't know if Charles Whitman read the play in the original, and that's how he decided to seek it out in English for his collection. I'm going to give you one other specific example of how did you find it. It doesn't involve an anthology, but a different sort of list. The key to any list is who has assembled it. Here again, it means finding people who have good taste and following them. Influencers, right? I mean, that's it's not a new concept. <laughs> Editors, publishers, artistic leaders. Publishers are an interesting example, I think, because there are names that we associate with major institutions like Scribner, for example, or Macmillan. But there was a time when it wasn't an institution, it was a person named Charles Scribner, or two in the case of the Macmillan brothers, who had taste and wanted to create a body of work. They chose books from manuscripts and decided to publish them out of their taste. The founders of the Dublin Gate Theater were two men that I think had good taste, based on what I know about some of the plays they produced. They were theater makers who interested me, and they, or someone, did a great job of keeping a record, an archive of all their work in the first 20 years, and that archive ended up being sold, oddly, to Northwestern University in Chicago at some point. I don't know the details of it, but Northwestern did a great job of organizing that material, cataloging it, and making that catalog available online. A few years back, I downloaded that 90-page PDF, and I started going through the list of productions, looking to see what caught my eye. That's Pretty random. I know, but oddly it worked out. One play title caught my eye, Women Without Men. The cast breakdown added to the interest, 11 women, no men. <laughs> Written by a woman named Hazel Ellis, whose name meant nothing to me. So I asked the library to make a scan of the play for me and send it to me digitally, which they happily did for a reasonable charge. And I asked them also to send the scrapbook pages of all the press clippings and some other material. The play was produced at the gate in 1938. It was a tremendous success. That means instead of running for one week, it ran for two. <laughs> and that was the end of it. Never revived, never published. Well, I received the scam. I loved the play. In this case, I thought it needed just a little bit of a trim, which isn't especially unusual. We produced the play in 2016. Critics and audiences both loved it. I'm sorry, again, to quote from my own press. It feels so braggy, but I'm trying to establish credibility here with you. <laughs> How does the Mint do it? Only a couple of years after it resurrected the work of the forgotten Irish playwright Teresa Deeby, the company presents Women Without Men by Hazel Ellis, a contemporary of Deeby's, also seemingly lost to history. And once again, we have to ask, who is Hazel Ellis? Why did we not know her? Why has this information been kept from us? Women Without Men is a sharply observant comedy drama filled with crackling ironies, a craftily worked out mystery, and an astringently unsentimental point of view. Truth is, if I didn't have so much else to worry about, or if I had more staff, I think I could get dozens of productions of that play performed across the country uh, at schools where theater departments are always looking for roles for women and are tired of doing the prime from Miss Jean Brody. <laughs> um, there was, in fact, a London production plan for the spring of 2020. 
I don't know what will happen next there. Bad luck. So searching is an important part of what I do. The question I'm asked most often after people have enjoyed a play they've never heard of before is how did you find it? And the truth is I get irritated by that question because it assumes that anyone looking in the right place could have found the play. And my trick is knowing where to look. Well, I do know where to look, that's true. And I'm good at reading plays too, and lots of people aren't. I, I can't see a play when I read it, but I can hear it and I can feel it. And when I read a play, I have a pretty good sense of what an audience will feel when they watch it. But the better question, the question that flatters me more is how did you know it was good? Well, I didn't know it was good. I knew that it moved me, that it pulled me in, and at some point it surprised me, and at another point it brought a tear to my eye, and most importantly, it made me care how it all turned out. I'm only doing plays I like, and the audience that I want is the audience that shares my taste. If you like two mint productions, you'll probably like them all, more or less. You may rank them, but I'm never trying to guess what someone else might like. I'm doing what I like and hoping to find an audience that agrees with me. If I like a play when I read it, I don't let the fact that no one else has considered doing it for a hundred years discourage me. And really, I don't think I've ever misjudged a play. Sometimes I end up doing a play that isn't quite good enough, but that's not because I've misjudged it. It's because I went forward despite of being unconvinced. It would be better if I never put myself in that position where that was necessary, but it happens. I'm running out of time, Maybe I can get away with it. The last time I did that, and you saw the play and liked it, but audiences were not as enthused as, as they often are. And I have to tell you, that however odd this seems, I was thrilled. I was delighted that my audience through their own taste, that they know the difference between good enough and really good. That was, it was great to see that they were saying, yeah, this one, not so much. <clears throat> now, there are some specific reasons why I was drawn to the idea of a neglected place in the first place. And this is something that I know is of special interest to my host, Professor Lowenstein, and to me too, although I rarely talk about it. Today, as I said on the screen there, the motto of the Mint is lost plays found here, but 25 years ago it was good stories well told. Professor Lowenstein dug up this quote from an interview I did six years ago and posted it on the website to promote my talk. Maybe you ran across this. I wanted to do old-fashioned plays that people never heard of. I'm extremely interested in the structure of the well-made play and why they've become neglected. After I did a few of them, that in itself fascinated me, the number of plays that are worth producing that somehow never are. The term well-made play is actually something of a pejorative. If you look it up, you'll find it describing a poorly made play, something formulaic, lacking in nuance or depth. So I, I'm not sure it's a useful term, although I used it in that interview. Here's a sentence from the Britannica definition. The technical formula of the well-made play, developed around 1825 by the French playwright Eugene Scribe called for complex and highly artificial plotting, a buildup of suspense, a climactic scene in which all problems are resolved, and a happy ending. Now, if you drop highly artificial, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, it sounds like a movie you might want to stream on a Saturday night. 
I love a play that brings an audience to the edge of their seats wondering what is going to happen next, wondering how the conflict will be resolved. I think the buildup of suspense is exciting and valuable. I think a climactic scene is ideal. I don't object to a happy ending, but the important thing about the ending is there needs to be legitimate doubt about how things will work out. Otherwise, how can there be suspense? If you're planning to watch conflict and come talk about it with me on Saturday, you'll see what I mean, I hope. So with the goal of creating a specific kind of experience for an audience, I went about seeking a specific kind of play, a play with a strong conflict, a good plot, and an ending that was surprising. But if you want audiences wondering how the story will end, you need a play that audiences don't know. The reason I rarely talk about this is because there comes a moment when I have to say something impolite about contemporary playwrights. So this is where we close the door. <laughs> contemporary playwrights don't write good plots. Or they don't know how to write good plots. Or if they want to write them and they know how, they come here and write for the screen where the skill is valued and where the compensation is better than it is in the theater. I believe, Daniel, that you're hoping I can speak to why this is the case, why contemporary playwrights can't write good plots. I'm not sure I can, not in a scholarly way at any rate, but I'll give it a shot. In the 20th century, certain influential intellectuals decided that if art was going to convey the chaos of modern life, especially the existential threat posed by nuclear war, drama had to be chaotic and disordered. So we've had symbolism and expressionism and absurdism and all sorts of experimental attempts to represent the chaos of modern life on stage. I read a great piece in The New Yorker in 1996 around the time that I was thinking hard about some of these questions. And I'm going to read you some of it. Because Bill Buford makes this point with great verve and style. As a side note, six years ago, I had an opportunity to meet Bill and tell him how important this essay was to me, and how much I valued it, and how long it sat on my desk right here next to my left hand, uh, because we hired his 11-year-old son to be in one of our plays, playing my wife's son. Theo, you, know, you remember Frederick? Yeah. yeah. Here's what Bill wrote. Around 1910, according to Virginia Woolf, human nature changed. If so, it must have gone and changed back again five years ago, maybe or the day before yesterday. Wolf's claim was about modernism and art and all those heavy theories that people were starting to propose to explain why books no longer had plots, portraits didn't look like people, and plays seemed to be about nothing at all. By 1910, the argument went, the world could no longer enjoy the certainties of the previous century. And the consequence for the novel was that many of its familiar features, plot, character, narrative, were seen to be contrived. Real life was too complex and elusive to be captured in a conventional story. Now, as it happens, 1910 through 1913 and beyond was actually a great time for the theater. I produced about a dozen terrific plays written between 1908 and 1913, those five years. That's probably more than a dozen. I don't know why it took the theater somewhat longer to abandon plot and character, but it did. I have a very little interest in non-narrative work, and therefore I admit I know very little about it. But I do think plot-driven drama was made old-fashioned in part by the rise of the off-Broadway theater in the late 50s, early 60s. Beckett and Albee and Pinter and Theater of the Absurd and plot just never made much of a comeback in the theater. I don't think it's because people don't want it. I think it's because writers have lost the knack 
and teachers have lost the knack, and because there's this generally disparaging notion that hangs on about the intellectual value of telling a good story. But there's one other aspect of this, and it's where I can blame the influence of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Strong conflict and a suspenseful plot is a great tool for keeping an audience engaged, for keeping them awake and interested. But movies can solve that problem differently with editing, with camera work. They change the shot or the perspective every few seconds. They jump from here to there effortlessly, and they can keep an audience alert using post-production instead of text, instead of narrative. Playwrights who are inevitably trying to parlay success in the theater into actual money, a staff writing gig or selling a screenplay, have no incentive to learn how to write 20 minute scene between two or three characters gathered around a coffee table. It won't get you a movie job. And I don't begrudge anybody a movie job. I'm just saying that's a fact. So when I went looking for plot driven plays that could provide suspense and a surprising ending, I had to look to the past. But I couldn't do well known work from the past because. How can you have an experience of suspense if you know how the play ends? So I began reading unfamiliar plays, hoping to draw it in and then be surprised. Is there still an audience for plays that are well constructed? I know that audiences are deeply pleased by how satisfying that experience can be. I'm going to give Bill Buford the last word on the subject from that same essay. Of the many definitions of story, the simplest may be this. It is a piece of writing that makes the reader want to find out what happens next. Good writers, it is often said, have the ability to make you keep reading them whether you want to or not. Is it really so strange that in the 18th century, novels were regarded as corrupting and not the sort of thing that a young woman should be allowed to read on her own? Story means pleasure as distinct from art. It would rather gratify than edify. But stories also protect us from chaos. And maybe that's what we unblinkered at the end of the 20th century or in 2022 find ourselves craving. It is possible that narrative is as important to writing as the human body is to represent, representational painting. We've returned to narratives in many fields of knowledge because it is impossible to live Thank you. Question. Please. I'm curious where, to me it seems like quite an aura of contrarianism that you embody or imbibe. I was curious where you got that from and how you cultivated it. Um, if there's anything from your past that you um, for whatever reason, just led you to go down the rabbit hole of old plays that led you on to this journey, possibly? Well, and, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And certain people are laughing at the idea that I might be have a streak of contrarianism. Um, <clears throat> I don't know the answer to the question, really. I, I, but I have this, but I remember when I was less than 10, I remember some kid in the Hebrew school carpool telling me that the best song was on the B side 
of the 45. And, 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 and I know as a kid, when I heard a song on the radio, a pop 40 song on the radio that I kind of liked, I wanted to get the album that came out before the one that had that single on it, to get closer to that raw personal expression that I think is important to art, that a, 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 an artist wanting to say something personal, not wanting to, needing to say something personal, as opposed to wanting to write another hit or be successful even, you know, that, that just where the impulse is. And um, so, so I do think that some of my favorite writers are, none of whom I've, I mean, a couple that I'm thinking about are not, well, Miles Mallison is the author of Conflict that we're, and I've done a couple of his plays, uh, um, but where there's a, the, the, the personal impulse in that writing may prevent them from creating something that has broad appeal. Teresa Devi, as you know, was mentioned in the video, is a writer, I've done four of her plays, and, and she, she never wrote anything that was really destined to have broad appeal, but it had art. And, and yes, that's of interest to me. Um, so, contrary to popular, m might be something that's a, just a little scratchier, a little thornier, a little more personal with fewer sanded edges, with, with fewer concerns for um, broad appeal. And I, and I think, you know, for example, I, I, I mean, I, I think that somebody like Steven Spielberg, you know, he, I mean, he's not trying to appeal to lots of people. I think he's driven, you know, in the same kind of personal way that lots of other very personal artists are. But what appeals to him appeals to lots of people, whereas what appeals to me appeals to fewer. <laughs> Does that? Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Dan? Um, the, I have the sense, I'm not sure if this is right, that um, in the last, say, 20 or 25 years, that maybe narrative-driven uh, theater has made a little bit of a comeback that, there, that um, it just seemed to me that uh, in the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s, if you went to a new play, it was almost always going to be uh, a dysfunctional family, you know, and just uh, 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 long day's journey into night by playwrights who weren't as good as uh, Eugene O'Neill. And uh, I mean, an early example of this would be, say, a play like Amadeus. Um, but it does, I mean, Ronald Harwood is a play, playwright that I like, for example. It, it, it seems, uh, Interact is, it, online is doing Doubt, I think, in a week or so. Uh, um, I, there are I, a lot look, of plays I, around. Bill so wrote that essay, as I said, in 1996. And he was, and I, look, I think that story, you know, the hunger for story is, is, um, you know, goes back to the cave. Absolutely. I think it is a primal, essential part of, and, and you know, like, the entire essay is, is terrific. And I just gave you <coughs> some tales there. But um, Bill talked about where, where story appears. And I, I can tell you, I mean, this is, I'm not addressing your question, so maybe I won't finish that sentence even. But, <laughs> but 
yes, the story is going to make, a story isn't going to go away. I mean, we were talking about this, at, story is alive and well on television now. And, and the, I think, you know, the reason that, you know, that binge watching became um, so popular is not because people wanted to spend 10 hours in front of the screen, it's because you wanted to watch the next episode because you wanted to find out what was going to happen next. Uh, and um, so I think there is really good writing for the screen, uh, contrary to what I said about, you, you know, movies and sitcoms, you know, but the, but the eight episode miniseries or that maybe have three seasons where, where it's a, a true novel-like storytelling, people are eating it up, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all, uh, all forms of literature I've experienced over a long period of time loss, uh, and by that I mean um, works sort of being lost to time or uh, original copies being burned in fires, things like that. And dramatic literature is no exception. Um, and we often hear summaries by older writers, older reviewers of these works, and so we can get a glimpse into what they were. And some of them were very popular at the time. Do you have a favorite lost play? No, I, you know, um, no, it's all, uh, I mean, it, it's interesting because the answer I really want to give you kind of goes a little bit to the topic of story because I have favorite stories about Lost Play. You know, so, um, so I mentioned Teresa Devi and that we've d done four productions of her work, three of her plays, and the fourth production was four one-act plays, which I call the evening the suitcase under the bed because that's where the plays were and because I went to Ireland and her uh, grand niece, you know, got the suitcase out from the under the bed <laughs> and let me take pictures of the pages, and you know, so you, you know, it, but, but that that's the story of the of it being lost. This, you know, so. No, I don't have <laughs> Yeah. So I'm interested in your, when you're looking for plays to produce, um, how economics plays a role in what you decide you want to choose. Because when I'm looking at plays, I, I, I recognize what you're saying. It's very true about how plot-driven stories sort of disappear. And I sort of think it's came along when Broadway couldn't pay more than a certain number of actors to appear on the stage. And so now you've got a lot of plays with small casts. Of course, the bigger cast plays are wonderful, and they, of course, invite plot. Yes. So it's, an, it's a good question. Um, and, and I'm not really speaking from one producer to another. I, I'm you know, just telling you my tale. I, I was blessed. by a flop I had in, in 2005. Um, I, and, and actually, I think it was a good play. I, I think in retrospect, the problem with the play was the title, which was Soldier's Wife. And I, I think that, that, you know, that, that Anybody who heard that title thought it was about a grieving widow instead of about a woman who found a career while her husband was, you know, that, and that, anyway. Um, but 
But I don't think I understood that at the time, and it did not, it, you know, I, I never had a play sell as poorly as that play. And when I picked it, I said, I, you know, it's, I think it's really, there's a lot I really like about it. It's not quite, it's a little more B than I would like. It should be more A, but, but, I, I'm, but it has a cast of five in a single set. <laughs> and, I, and I knew, you know, that experience in terms of how much we, how poorly it sold, which I now think was the title, but which at the time I thought was maybe just I hadn't held myself to a high enough standard, to, you know, said to me, don't try to save money on the play, because you'll lose. Do the good plays. And if you need 12 actors, you need 12 actors. And, um, and you're right that and, I, you know, my lesson to myself now is we'll do fewer plays, but make sure they're good. If you can't afford to do, I'm about to do, a, because of COVID, I'm, I'm going to, my cast of 11 is going to be 15, because I'm going to have four understudies mm -hmm. in a 99 seat theater. I mean, it's madness, but I'll pay for it by doing less work rather than let, you know degrade the whole event by doing plays that I you know that and, and I've done some you know good I'm do, I'm a play right now with the cast of five it's a great story and it's great storytelling um, but you're right it's a lot easier to have a complicated narrative if you can have four threads that you can get out of 16 people. And there's a lot of plays I can't do because it's a cast of 40. I mean, and, you know, nobody has enough dressing room space for that. <laughs> yeah, Doug? If I'm not mistaken, one of your first plays was Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah. How did that go unproduced in so many years? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, it, it, it the, the answer to that question is kind of, you know, is different from, there may be other examples of it, it's rather specific. When we did Uncle Tom's Cabin, and there were a gazillion different versions of that, uh, but when we did one, the one that was published in, you know, Great American Plays or whatever that anthology was by George Aiken. <clears throat> Um, just as a side note, uh, Harry Tubman would not license the play, the, the book, for the theater to anybody because the theater was the house of the devil and she didn't want good Christian people who might be interested in her story ended up in a theater. <laughs> so instead, and, and, then, and then Uncle Tom's Cabin, at the point that when we did it, I remember the, the um, marketing line I had on our flyer was something like the most frequently performed play in the history of the world. Do you, do you know that this, in the Soviet Union, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a huge, there was a huge appetite for Uncle Tom's Cabin. There was a huge appetite for Uncle Tom's Cabin for decades. And, I, and I'm looking at this anthology and I'm thinking Uncle Tom's Cabin and I've never read, I had at that point never read the book and I thought it would be provocative to do that play because I, because I know that that, you know, I know it would be provocative but I don't know what it is and I read it and I said I don't understand how Uncle Tom got such a bad name. What a great man. What a hero. What a beautiful person. And I, I mean, it was one of the most exciting moments in my career, really, because that was one of the first plays that I picked for the Mint. And 
we put a quote from me in the press release and that ended up in the Times Review <laughs> where I said, you know, the reason for this production is to reclaim Tom's good name. But Tom had a very bad name. So, you, you know, so, um, so that's why nobody did it. Because the idea of doing it, but, it, but it's, pre, it's prejudice in the sense of it's prejudging in the way that I thought, in the way that I didn't, in the way that anybody said he's an Uncle Tom who hadn't read Uncle Tom's Cabin, the novel, would be not know what they were talking about, would be speaking glibly, would be, you know, speaking prejudicial. Because, and I understand, you know, the expression, but it's not right, in my opinion. He was a beautiful, strong, chin-up man who believed in turning the other cheek. Which is a legitimate was was a legitimate way for Martin Luther King, to, or for Mahatma Gandhi to 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 exercise civil disobedience. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, you, sure. You said that the hunger for plot or narrative or story is fundamental to the human experience. And so could you please expand on why there's such a distaste in the realm of contemporary writers for plot? Well, you know, Bill Buford says it, right? It, it, its purpose is to gratify, not edify. It, so the highbrow writer isn't trying to gratify. I, I, I mean, there's just a prejudice against entertaining people. It's, it's lowbrow. I consider myself squarely middlebrow. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, I, I, I mean, I, that's my opinion. I, I, I can't offer more than that. Um, I don't know, but You know, a challenging play, meaning a, or a challenging piece of modern writing, or, you know, James Joyce, or what, you know, where the, you know, the, the challenge, the intellectual challenge of that, it, um, for one thing, it invites ongoing scholarship. Because it's really easy for scholar number nine to disagree with scholar number eight, and you know, and literature that doesn't kind of support that, that simply grabs you by the scruff of the net and neck and drags you through an event and gives you a feeling. There's not, there's nothing to, to for academics to do with that. So, so. Nobody, you, you know, and which is not, I'm not criticizing the academics, I'm saying, but I'm recognizing that, I mean, we're all recognizing that if you can't write a thesis about it, you know, and then if thesis, if those theses aren't being written, you know, then it doesn't end up in the anthology because it's not necessarily of interest to scholarship. And it's not in the textbook because there's nothing to talk about. And um, that's all I got. <laughs> yes? Hi, I'm interested in how you think that, like, how personal authors and writers can manage to balance their personal ideas and their personal wants to write in a story, even though it might have less appeals, and then make it appeals to more people. And then how do you think like we can brought attention to play, like more playwrights? Even in this time that people have so much emphasis on streamings, like things that's flashy or not exactly flashy, but you know how the special effects, new trends, things like that. And final question is just, have you ever thought of maybe a hybrid of new technology that's using playwrights that actually make playwrights difference from the past, like maybe an introduction to VR, <laughs> like having the 
audience actually interact with the actors on stage? Just curious, have you ever thought of any possibilities on that? Well, no, I haven't. I mean, I, it, it, you know, I'm, the future's gonna be your problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, my, I'm interested in the, listen, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to change the subject for a second because I can't answer all of your questions, but there's something that didn't end up in the paper that, that I shouldn't, I shouldn't not say. I've, everything that I've said, you know, is truthful. But I, but there's I learned one I learned something along the way that was not part of my thinking when I began. But I learned that if you do a, not, a lot of plays that were written up until 1940, but not after, nobody ever says F. And actually, audiences are happier if they're not being sworn at. And the, and and uh, and the audi I mean, my audience doesn't say I love the fact that nobody swears, but they but they do come to the theater not expecting to be sworn at, and they come to the theater not worried about whether somebody will take their clothes off without them having been warned that that might happen or you know and and you know there are boundaries from these older plays that that um, that is also I think an ingredient to why my audience is so passionate about coming to the men you know that that the experience it can be intensely emotional it can be it can be intensely scary it can be intensely moving but um, but it but it's free from gratuitous stuff and um, and and that's over you know in terms of contemporary anything and it's hard really to represent modern people without letting them swear um, so my version of the hybrid in terms of technology is that it is we I have been because well let me just keep it simple um I have about 23 camera edit archival recordings of 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 well, my last 20 productions dating back to 2013. We've just we've recorded everything. And over the pandemic, as, as uh, I said in the video, we offered, and those were all recorded live in front of an, an audience. You can usually see the audience down at, in the front row and you can hear the audience responding. And, and, um, and we offered free streaming and, and the response was just, profoundly gratifying and people you know and people wrote me I got all these emails and you thank goodness finally theater and I'm thinking what's wrong with you don't you have a Netflix account why do you care about watching a play on your computer but they did so that's you know the combination of old and new um, and now they're writing me every day saying why can't we see the daughter-in-law Please stream more. And some of that is they don't want to leave the house yet. And some of that is they don't want to leave the house ever, which is a different problem. You know? and, um, and I have to make more plays and record them. You know? But, but I, I'm not going to make something new. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the new form that's for a younger person to figure out. Shall we stop? Yeah. Jonathan, thank you so much.